So we'll go ahead and jump into this. Uh, so first of all, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Darian Ziegler. I'm an architect at ResTark Design Studio. It's a uh, full service design firm in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, I also had the opportunity to collaborate with Black Spectacles. I was one of their project management workshop instructors from June of 2020 until uh, November of 2022. And I also had the opportunity to help uh, make some of those workshops as well as do a little bit of script writing for them. And I'm really excited to host this workshop because the workshops I hosted for Black Spectacles were project management. Um, so I have a lot of practice talking about this. And now I'll take just one minute to go down the list. And if you can introduce yourself, um, tell us where you are in your testing process and let me know if there's anything in particular that you wanna focus on or learn about the project management exam. Um, we have slides put together that go through some sample questions, but if there is anything in particular you're interested in learning more about, I can always do my best to, to focus in on that. Um, so when I say your name, please introduce yourself. First up, I have Mukta. Hi. Uh, so I have just finished my master's and I have all my uh, hours to take my exams. I did take one, did not pass that. This is my, uh, like, I'm getting now into the, uh, again, into the study groove. I'm working with Champlain Architecture in Cincinnati. And this initiative for Saturday is the first one to get me back into the mood of studying. I was uh, doing some of that when I was the student, but, well, it needs a lot more effort. So I don't exactly, I'm not in good, you know, uh, uh, I have not had any prep so far, so I'm looking forward to this, and then hopefully I'll have some information about the resources, and then I can take it further. Yeah, thanks for joining. We're happy to have you. Um, and it's great that this is uh, just your first foray into studying, because that means expectations are low for me. Um, so thank you so much. Next up, I have, I think it's Alyssa. Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Alyssa. Um, I've already taken practice management, so this is my second exam I'm studying for. Nice. Welcome. It's really good to study for these two back to back and take them within proximity of each other because there is so much overlap. So you'll have a little bit of a head start here. Next up, I have Deb. Welcome, Deb. Hi, Darian. Thanks for hosting. Um, yes, I'm like Alyssa. I took practice management and now I'll be taking uh, project management next Thursday. Next Thursday? Well, good luck in advance. Thank you. <laughs> next up, I have Kajal. Uh, hey, hi. Thanks for hosting. Uh, so I have established uh, all of my hours to take the exams. I have got all the resources. I'm just going through uh, all the uh, groups on Facebook and just learning more about the exams and the pattern of it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is kind of initial stage for me as well. Awesome. Well, welcome and congratulations for getting started. Thank you. And last but not least, I have Tim. Welcome, Tim. Oh, it looks like we have two Tims in the meeting now, and he is still connecting to audio. Well, welcome, Tim. So first things first on this slide, we also have some important references. I'm gonna go ahead and post a link in the chat and that link will take you to a copy of these slides. Um, you guys can view them, download them, do whatever you want, click on all these links here. Um, all of the information that we're presenting today is uh, free online. It's all things that NCARB has released um, because this presentation is put on by AIA Cincinnati and it's a nonprofit. We're not charging anything for it. We can't use any copyrighted materials, but we can still recommend copyrighted materials. Um, so important references, it, if you are just getting started out, if you're someone who's already taken a test, you've probably already seen these guys, uh, but the NCARB guidelines, um, these uh, 
talk about the whole format of the test as well as going into the individual comments, uh, uh, the individual uh, divisions rather, and the tests, the resources, this is really your Bible, everything testing. Uh, NCARB licensing requirement tool, this guy is helpful for figuring out exactly what you need to get licensed in each jurisdiction. Um, and there are also some pending updates with this, especially in regards to the rolling clock being uh, moonlighted. Uh, so I think there are still a couple states like New York and I believe Illinois both have the rolling clock as a part of their law somehow. Uh, so. The rolling clock is still in effect for certain jurisdictions, but it has been eliminated for a lot of them. Be sure to check that out. Make sure you're familiar with it. NCARB demo exam. I cannot click this link because I am not testing. It will not let people who are not testing click uh, this link. Uh, but NCARB released a demonstration exam for all of their divisions. If you maybe started testing a few years ago and are just getting back into it, this is a new feature and it's really great. A lot of times, if you wanted to have experience using a software format that looked like the actual exam, you had to pay for something like a Black Spectacles uh, subscription. But now NCARB has released an exact clone of the exams, and it includes a full exam for each division. Okay, we do post these videos on... Um, so we do record these and we post them on AIA Cincinnati's YouTube. Um, not a very big audience, but a couple people have watched them. If you visit AIA Cincinnati's YouTube page, there's also uh, a few existing video uploads, one for introduction to testing. I think we have practice management up there and PPD and PDD maybe. Um, we're trying to fill in each exam. This one was originally scheduled for... March or May maybe, uh, but we didn't have enough registrants to uh, to do the whole workshop. So this is actually take two for the project management workshop. Very excited so many of you joined today. Um, NCARB also has their own test prep videos on YouTube and those are really great to just give a quick watch uh, right before you start studying for each individual exam. Also great general information if you are just getting started testing. Okay, so overview. Uh, we're going to do an overview of the whole exam today. Then we're going to dig into the individual divisions that NCARP has indicated will be within this exam. So our overview, this is directly taken from the ARE guidelines. Um, and so hopefully you have seen it before and you are familiar with it. There is some good information in here. Uh, project management, one of the shorter exams, total of 75 items. Uh, you're going to have two case studies, which is true of all the exams. Case studies will have between 12 and 16 questions. Your test duration is three hours, total appointment, three hour, 40 minutes. Um, this averages out to about two and a half minutes per question average. I always like to remind people that you have two and a half minutes per question average. That's uh, not counting the case studies where you probably want to spend a little more time per question. So one of the big things I'm going to be talking about as we go through this workshop is the importance of understanding if you're spending too long on an individual question when it's time to cut your losses and just move forward. Um, the sections that are within the project management exam, section one, resource management, section two, project work planning, section three, contracts, section four, project execution, and section five, project quality control. Do you want you to pay attention to the percentages here? This represents the percentage of questions on the full exam that will be in each of these sections. Section three contracts is going to have between 25 to 31% of the questions. This is way more, um, percentage than most of the other categories. So when you're studying, make sure you're seeing, oh, well, it looks like the majority of the questions on this exam are centered around the contracts. I should be spending more time focusing on those than resource management, for example, um, which isn't to say you shouldn't study everything, but know how to game the system and know how to get the most bang for your buck when it comes to your study time. References. Uh, the project management and practice management exams both draw heavily from the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice. Um, NCARB 
also list a few more resources, but really the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice is going to be your primary for both project management and practice management. Uh, it's definitely worth reading all the way through. I have to say when I personally was studying, I did not read the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice. You might also hear me call it the AHPP. Um, I didn't read it until after I was already working for Black Spectacles and I was trying to answer other people's questions about project management. And then I was like, I really need to read this whole book. And I probably ended up reading it back to cover uh, at least a couple times uh, by the time I was all said and done doing script writing and content creation. And if I had just read this when I was studying for the exams, it would have been way easier, I think, because it has a lot of information. Um, I do like to also note, though, that the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice current edition is from 2014. The um, contracts get updated a lot more than the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice. There will be certain things within the AHPP which don't jive with the current language in the actual AIA contracts. Uh, always default to the AIA contracts if you see some sort of small conflict between the two because the contracts are updated a lot more than the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice. Okay. Uh, other references they list, professional practice, guide to turning designs into buildings, uh, the project resource manual, CSI manual of practice. Uh, they put a star here, which means it's a primary resource, but I, you're only going to have a couple of questions on CSI divisions in the whole of all of the exams, so don't get too caught up in that. And here are the contracts. Uh, I always like to talk about the big three contracts. These are the ones that you're going to see most on your exam. Those big three contracts are the A101, the B101, and the A201. So these are the contracts that make up the relationship for design bid build. Uh, A101 is the standard form of agreement between the owner and contractor where the basis of payment is stipulated sum. A201 is the general conditions of the contract for construction. That's kind of like the glue that holds the A101 and the B101 together. And then the B101 is the standard form of agreement between the owner and architect. Um, you really want to spend a lot of time digging into those three contracts and once you feel like you're really familiar with them, then start looking at these other ones. Use those three contracts and your knowledge of those to kind of get you familiar with some of these others that you won't have as many questions about, but are still listed as primary references on the exam. So for example, A133 is a standard form of agreement to the owner and construction manager uh, as constructor with base payment is the cost of the work plus a fee with the GMP. Um, this one you will get some questions about, but you're gonna get way more about the A101. All right, so you're going to have case studies on this exam, like all of them. Uh, the uh, ARE guidelines do actually define what you might get as references within the case studies if you really dig into it. So in the project management exam, some of the items that might be included as references and case studies include the AIA contracts, you're almost certain to have at least one, uh, design and construction schedules, program requirements, project budgets and cost estimates. You might also see staff labor rates. Break policy. Uh, if you are someone who maybe started testing pre-COVID and are getting back into it, the break policy is new and has some nuances. You're going to want to have a strategy for how you want to take your break before you get into the exam. I like to tell people that there's no right or wrong way, uh, as long as you know what you're going to do before you start your test. Um, so with the new break policy, any question that you have seen before you take a break will not be available to you after the break. Um, so if you're someone who maybe likes to look at their case studies first to understand what references they have, if you look at all the questions in a case study, then take a break, then come back, you won't have access to that case study and that reference you might've been planning on having a, a chance to look at for the other half of your test. Um, so this is super important to remember. Um, my personal strategy, and this is even testing before the new break policy, um, I just wouldn't take a break because I, I need to focus. If I would have left the computer, I feel like it would have broken my focus. Um, however, 
that's pretty easy to do for something like project management or practice management. By the time you're into PPD and PDD, which are four and a half hour long tests, not taking a break is a lot harder and you need to plan like how much water or coffee you're gonna drink before you get into that uh, room, if that's something that you're going to pursue. Um, so do you wanna bring that up? No right or wrong way, but plan on taking a break if you need one when you start the test so you can decide if you want to leave some questions unseen or not uh, and make sure that if you are going on a break every question you've seen at least has a guess there is no penalty for guessing even if it's wrong okay um, so i have a couple more slides in here uh, just based on my own experience with black spectacles and giving people advice on how to study the contracts uh, because they are hard to study. Uh, I ran through this a little bit already. The A101, the B101, and the A201 are the big three. You're going to want to focus most of your time and attention on these. Um, unless you are much smarter than me, you won't be able to memorize every single word of every contract. Uh, I always like to suggest that people focus on the table of articles. You can't remember every word, but maybe you can um, just memorize the table of contents so that if you do see one of these, um, if you do see one of these contracts on your exam as a reference document, you can quickly go to where you know the answer is because you know where the articles are located. Um, knowing the table of articles also gives you a general idea of what is contained in each contract, which means you probably know what each contract is used for. And you're definitely going to get questions that ask you things like, um, which contract would you use in this situation? Uh, super helpful. You also want to practice searching through the contract documents for specific pieces of information. You can search uh, on the testing software when you get a reference document. So get used to using control F and picking a keyword and searching for it. Um, those skills are going to help you not just on the exams, but also in real life when you're reviewing a hundred page submittal too. Um, and it's going to help you game the test a little bit more. A lot of these uh, testing strategies aren't even how well do you know architecture or are you going to be a great architect? It's, it's just, using the resources and the tools you have to answer the questions as quickly and as accurately as possible. Um, another great idea is to ask your work if you can review the contracts for real projects. Uh, at your work, you might not be using the AIA contract documents, even if you're not, uh, most contracts are going to have the same bits of information. And having that real life connection to a project you're working on and seeing how it is contractually structured can be super helpful. Um, so a link to the free AIA contracts are available to ARE candidates included on the exams tab of your NCARB record under additional resources. Uh, they used to have previews available that were really easy to access from AIAcontracts.org, but they recently restructured it. It's a little bit harder to find them, although you still can find them online if you try. Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of these AIA contract docs is definitely through the exams tab of your NCARB record under additional resources. Okay. Almost done with the general information. Uh, this is super important and something I did not know until I was probably two or three tests deep. There is actually a rhyme and reason behind the AIA contract document numbering. Um, the B number is the series. Uh, uh, so B are always architect owner contracts. A's are always owner contractor contracts. C's are other contracts. Uh, the type is in the next position. So 101 is like the, the typical. Uh, the third position here represents the delivery. So the B101 is the owner architect agreement for design bid build. Um, once you get into 141, I think that one's construction manager as something. Um, I don't have them all memorized. Uh, and then the sequence is the next denominator. The last four are always the addition. So if you go to this website listed right here, it's super helpful and it'll dig into it a little bit more. 
um, I think it's good to know and it can help you answer a lot of questions. This might even be something you want to write down on your whiteboard once you get into the exam. Just write this little note right here so that way once you start testing in case you panic and are like, oh my god, why can't I remember what the B141 is? You have this little reference and in a moment of panic it can help you think through it a little bit more. Okay, Project delivery methods are a huge topic that confuse everyone, and the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice doesn't do the best job of explaining them, in my opinion. Um, so when we get to project delivery methods, my first step is always not to panic. Don't worry, they're confusing, but there are a few good resources out there. Um, so this one is one of my favorites, and I'll post that in the chat too. Uh, this is on uh, what used to be AIAContractDocuments.org, um, but it has contract relationship diagrams for each of the common delivery methods. Uh, these are present in the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice as well, but if you look at them here, they list these key attributes. Uh, they also have links to the about pages for all the contracts that are listed. Um, and here you can read about the synopsis of the document, the purpose, related documents, etc. cetera. Um, I also like this because it lists all the different variations that you could have. Most of these variations are like different forms of payment, even though it's the same project delivery. So design, bid, build, conventional, that one's pretty easy. Small projects, pretty easy. We keep going, it gets a little more complicated talking about the CM-led project delivery down into the different variations of integrated project delivery that are available with those different agreements as well. Um, so that's another great resource to check out once you start digging into project delivery methods. Okay, uh, that was a lot of information and I've talked a lot. Does anyone have any questions before we start digging into the individual sections uh, that are present on this exam and into some practice questions? Okay, cool. Well, if you do have questions, feel free to stop me anytime and ask them. All right, so section one is resource management. Uh, there's a few objectives here. The way this test is structured, you have the divisions. The division here is project management. That's broken down into different sections. This section is resource management and each section also has its own objectives. Um, and then when they're developing and writing questions, they are specifically trying to craft these questions based around these individual objectives. Um, so objective 1.1, determine criteria required to assemble a team. Objective 1.2, assess criteria required to allocate and manage project resources. Um, and now we're going to do a few sample questions based on this first section. And this is an interactive workshop. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the question and then I will probably turn my camera off, maybe mute myself, let you guys talk about it amongst yourselves or see if anyone wants to uh, suggest an answer. Um, so sample item number one, an architect is responding to an RFP for an architect-led design build multi-building office park project. Which of the following will be the primary responsibilities of the architect while managing the project? Check the four that apply. Our options here, direct the engineering consultants in the selection of the building systems, develop and maintain project schedule, assume responsibility for the accuracy of the consultant's work, develop and maintain the project budget, schedule and control means and methods of construction, and develop staffing assignments for all project team members. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. And then maybe I'll just call on someone, uh, not to put anyone on the spot, but to make sure that we're all participating. And if you don't know, just feel free to say, I don't know. Okay. So let's see who's first on my list. Mukta, you're first on my list. What are you thinking? Uh, I'm thinking develop and maintain project schedule, develop and maintain project budget, mm -hmm. um, develop staffing assignment for all project team members, and I think assume responsibility for accuracy of consultant's work. Yeah. 
All right. I agree with all of those. And one thing I like to do when it comes to these choose all that apply questions is start by using a project, uh, a process of elimination rather. Um, so what didn't we choose? We didn't choose direct the engineering consultants in the selection of building systems. That seems really nuanced, maybe, and you shouldn't be directing them. Hopefully they're suggesting to you what, what would be good. Um, so maybe that's one we could have crossed off. You do have the ability to highlight and cross off when you're taking the exam. Highly suggest you do both of those. The other one we didn't check was schedule and control means and methods of construction. Uh, that's probably one that we could have crossed off right away. Means and methods are never the architect. Um, that's kind of the classic things that comes up during CA. When you get an RFI, you look at it and you go, well, that's means and methods. I can't answer that. Um, so Gupta was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Our correct answers here. Develop mm -hmm. and maintain the project schedule. Assume responsibility for the accuracy of the consultant's work. Develop and maintain project budget and schedule Oh, mm -hmm. schedule and control means and methods mm -hmm. of construction? That seems weird. <laughs> Let's see the rationale here. So the architect's handbook of professional practice explains that an architect-led design build. Ah, we missed a key word. It's an architect-led design build project. Oh, so if it was design bid okay. build. But since it is design build, that means the architect is leading the build team too, which maintains the schedule and controls the means and methods of construction. <laughs> so this is one of those instances where you should, where I should have used my skills and um, yeah. highlighted that word, architect led design build. That was the word we missed that was really important to whether or not this answer was correct or not. Okay. So does anyone have any questions about that? That was a tricky one. All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, sample item number two. An architect has a total design budget of $300,000. To estimate the weekly hours for each member of the architectural design team, the following criteria must be considered. The design schedule for the project is 16 weeks long at 40 hours per week. 30% of the total design fee is allocated to design consultants. The firm goal is to achieve a, multi a 3.0 multiplier for all employees and 25% of the principal's time will be devoted to the project. Utilization of the project architect and architectural designer should be maximized. Drag the weekly hour allocations for each design team member from the left on the labor uh, from the left onto the labor schedule. Not all allocations will be used. Um, so this isn't important for project management so much, but it will be really important for programming and analysis. Uh, on these drag and drop questions, you can rotate them. Um, if you right click, it'll give you the option to rotate. You have to type in the degree of the rotation, but it'll rotate. This is something I did not know until after I'd taken multiple exams and I found out you could rotate it during the exam. They hide it in the guidelines. It's very important to know that you can rotate these. So this is a really tricky one to do on this. Um, on this workshop format. Does anyone wanna take a stab at this? Uh, I never like to actually ask people to answer the math questions out loud. A lot of times I just like to go through them as a group because no one likes to be put on the spot for math questions. Do I have any volunteers though? Okay, we're just gonna go through this one together. Um, so, here was the correct answer and a rationale. So to determine the number of hours to allocate for each design team member, begin by calculating the weekly direct rate budget and removing 30% for design consultants. This is done by uh, dividing the maximum labor budget with the design consultant fees removed by the company multiplier, then dividing by the weeks of the project, step one. So step one, we are taking, let me pull open my 
controls here. So I can scroll back. So step one, what we're doing is we're taking the total design budget of $300,000 and we're multiplying by 70%. That gets us the total budget we have. It's taking out our consultant's fees. Then we are dividing that by three. Uh, that 3.0 is the net multiplier. Um, if you're not familiar, the net multiplier is the um, amount. Oh, sorry, there's people yelling outside. Um, the net multiplier is the amount you take in employees' billable rates and multiply it by, or their direct salary rates and multiply it by to get their billable rate. So uh, hopefully you're getting paid more than this, but if you have an employee who's... Um, whose direct um, salary rate is $10 an hour, you multiply that by three to get $30 an hour, which is the billable rate. That's what you are building that employee out as and what the um, client would see when you get to your billable rates table. That's something that you usually include in a contractor proposal. It just shows the hourly rates for your typical employees going from project manager to architect to intern, et cetera. Um, so what we've done here is taken the total fee, multiplied it by 70% to get the architect's portion of that, divided it by three to get the amount that can be directly dedicated to the salary rate for each employee. And then we have divided that by 16 weeks. So we can spend an actual amount of $4,375 per week. So that was step one. Uh, Next, it says allocate the principal's weekly hours to the project, which is step two. The utilization rates of both the project architect and the architectural designer to be maximized, meaning each of these project team members will allocate 40 hours per week on the project. So let's go back to our prompt here to remind ourselves. 25% of the principal's time will be devoted to the project. So that's what this is right here. We've got uh, 0.25, 25% times 40 hours. When you are seeing these questions, always assume everyone is working 40 hours a week. So the principal is spending 10 hours each week on this project. We multiply that by their direct billable rate. Uh, the principal's direct billable rate is $95. He's spending an actual amount of $950 per week working on this project. So now we have our principal's component of this fee. If we go back to our prompt here, utilization of the project architect and architectural designer should be maximized. That means they're spending all 40 hours a week on this project. In step three, you can see that they added the direct salary rates for the project manager uh, and, or rather the project architect and the designer uh, together before they multiplied it by 40 hours. You're looking at order of operations. You could have taken 40 times 40, plus 25 times 40, or you could add them together and then multiply it, doesn't matter. Um, so they are spending a total of $2,600 per week. So we're gonna add that 950 to the 2,600, and we're gonna subtract that from our budget. Our budget was $4,375 per week, minus 2,600, minus 950, means we have $825 per week remi remaining to spend uh, between the remaining staff, which in this instance is just the project manager. So we're gonna take that 825 divided by $40 per hour direct salary rate to understand that he can spend up to 20.625 hours per week on this project without blowing our budget. Um, so, this was a pretty intensive question. Uh, none of the math was super hard. It's mostly just trying to pick apart the pieces of what the question was asking. Um, if you looked at this and you went, I don't think I know how to do this, don't be afraid to flag it, guess something and move on. Uh, because again, you have two and a half minutes average per question over the course of the entire test. Um, spending 10 minutes doing this one and still not feeling confident in your answer is only going to hurt you. Um, so know yourself, know if you think you can get to the right answer, know if this is worth it for you. 
if you read through it quickly, totally understood it, you probably could get this done in two minutes. But if you maybe just looked at it, saw too many words, panicked, flag it, move on, maybe in your whiteboard, write a little note about it and say question number two, um, a resource utilization question, lots of math, come back at time. So that you know, once you're done with your other questions, if it makes sense to go back and see if you can get the right answer here. Does anyone have any questions about that one? All right, moving right along to the next section. Here we are at project work planning. This is section two of the PJM exam. In this section, you will evaluate effective ways to develop and communicate a work plan with the assembled project team in order to complete the project. Um, and as a project manager, you spend way more time work planning than you ever thought you would when you were taking these exams. Uh, so objective 2.1 is develop and maintain a project work plan. Objective 2.2, determine criteria required to develop and maintain the project schedule. And objective 2.3, determine appropriate uh, communication to project team, owner, contractor, consultants, and internal staff. Our questions here, sample item number three. A construction manager will best be used by joining the team during which phase of a fast track project? So if I'm looking at this, I'm going to highlight a couple words. I'm going to highlight construction manager probably, so I remember who we're talking about. Probably also going to highlight fast track project. Um, does everyone know what fast track means? Does anyone want to tell us what that means? Okay, I'll tell you. Um, so a fast track project is a project um, where you are uh, completing permit documents or a package for one part of it while it is still in design. Common fast track are often like early foundations package. You're putting out that early foundations or early structural package in advance of the full building design being completed. Um, sometimes people also are separating the packages out into um, like shell or interiors or maybe the interior design is a separate package. And depending on how you're doing that, you can consider that a fast track process. Okay, next person on my list is Alyssa. Alyssa, what are you thinking here? Um, I'm thinking to bring in the CM at schematic design. And so I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, sorry. I was just thinking out loud. No worries at all. Um, so I am tending to agree with you, and I'm hoping that NCARP does too. And exactly correct. So rationale. The Arctic's Handbook of Professional Practice identifies that an owner will gain greatest advantage from a CM by including them during the schematic design phase for the remainder of the project. This will provide continuity to the project in terms of a project design, budget, and schedule. A CM adds technical and cost estimating advice, so their joining the team early increases their value to the project and reduces risks associated with a fast-track project. The other three phases are all typically occur after the design has been set. Um, so I think one of the keywords here really was fast track project, uh, the way the Architects Handbook of Professional Practice talks about fast track. And it, it always makes me laugh when I read it. It says um, the challenges of fast track are not often understood by the ownership and design team. Uh, and if you've ever done a fast track project, that's almost always true. Um, when you are creating these separate packages while the design is still being developed, it can lead to coordination issues. Um, and having a CM on board early to provide that input into constructability and to help respond to any changes that occur as the design develop, uh, the design develops after one package is already in can be really helpful. On these exams, you'll definitely get a few questions about whether or not a CM-led project delivery or a design bid build or negotiated select teams project delivery is going to be most appropriate in a situation. So I think this is a really good example of the type of question you're going to see on the real exam. All right, on to our next question. You'll also see at least one of these little schedule chart guys. Uh, sample item number four, during the construction document phase, the owner requests changes that will delay permitting by three weeks. 
uh, delay bidding by two weeks and add an additional three weeks to the construction schedule. Click on the project completion point that reflects the impact of these changes. Each vertical line in the schedule represents two weeks. Oh, so I hate the way that's formatted. Okay. So when we're looking at this question, we first have to figure out the time impact. So permitting will be delayed by three weeks. Bidding will be delayed by two weeks, plus an additional three weeks to the construction schedule. And we are looking specifically for the project completion point that reflects these changes. Next on my list, I have Deb. Deb, where are you thinking? Um, okay, let's see. Uh, permitting by three weeks. So where's permitting? Okay, and it looks like construction is dependent on permitting. So that's minus three, um, or that's plus three. Delay is forward, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, delay bidding, bidding. It looks like bidding and permitting are uh, in conjunction. Is that the right word? They're, they're yeah. Parallel. Um, okay, so that's by two weeks. So that doesn't really matter. And then additional three weeks to the construction schedule. Uh, okay, so then, so I guess if we're just really adding three weeks, that would put us, and the question is, click on the project completion point that reflects the impact of these changes. Okay, so they're not asking when then project completion is. So in that case, would it just be, would it just bump up three weeks? So that would be uh, one week. What are these, each vertical line on the schedule? Oh, that represents two weeks, okay. So then would it be right after the August 29th mark, like between, click on the project completion point. Oh, project completion, okay. So then that would be, um, right about three weeks from the diamond. So that's right there, maybe. Yeah, no, I think you did great. Um, I think one thing though, and you, you hit everything they asked about, but I think they want you to compound the three week delay with the bidding plus the three week to the construction schedule. Oh, okay. like the so the bidding that, and the permit overlapped, but. So six weeks out, would you say that that would be two, four, six? Okay, so May 8th, yes. Yeah, I think right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> no, no worries, you did great. Uh, when they ask you that, those kind of questions, the words feel really confusing. They, they find like the most confusing way to ask the simplest question, it feels like sometimes. Um, so one thing I did want to talk about is this little box right here. Anytime you have a click on the area question, there is a little box that you can't see defined. Um, so don't get too worried if you're not clicking exactly the right spot. Like you can see on this example, really we want to click dead center right there on that line probably, but they clicked slightly to the right and we could have even clicked further out on either side and it still would have came up correct. Um, so just don't let that freak you out. Know that there is always kind of a buffer around that zone. You don't have to click it within a millimeter. Does anyone have questions on that? All right, moving right along. Uh, so the rationale here, delays to permitting will cause other items to be delayed. The overall schedule will need to be adjusted. Delays to bidding and permitting are concurrent, so they push back to the start of construction by three weeks. Additional three weeks must be added to the construction timeline. New completion date will be six weeks later. And Deb already covered pretty much all of that. And now on to everyone's favorite spot, contracts. Uh, contracts, we've talked about this a little bit already. This is the portion of the exam that has the most questions associated with it. So objective 3.1 here, evaluate and verify adherence to the owner architect agreement. That's the, the B101 is mostly what they're talking about. Objective 3.2, interpret key elements of and verify adherence to the architect consultant's agreement. Um, that's the C401. 
objective 3.3, interpret key elements of the owner contractor agreement. They're usually talking about the A101 here, although there are different contracts for like owner uh, contractor agreement for design bid uh, for CM led project delivery, et cetera. The A201 is the general conditions. So that also gets grouped here under this objective. Objective 3.4, interpret key elements of the owner architect agreements, integrate an owner's consultant's work into the project. And I think that's all for contracts. Our sample question, the AV consultant is installing the wiring and equipment for the office intranet and notices conflicts within the HVAC ductwork. According to the AIA document C401, what should the AV consultant do? One, notify the architect only. Two, notify the mechanical consultants only. Three, notify both the architect and the mechanical consultant. Or four, uh, work around the ducts to complete the work. So I will give you a second to think about that. And then we'll call on the next person on the list to try to work through what the answer is. Okay, next on my list is Tim. Tim, uh, what answer are you thinking here? Or which ones aren't you thinking? We can also do a process of elimination. Uh, well, process of elimination will be the last one, work around the ducks. <laughs> <laughs> I need to notify somebody. I just don't know if it's both of us or just one. So I'm gonna say both. I think you're not wrong. In real life, I would yeah. hope that they would notify both. Uh, but because I looked ahead, I know that isn't the right answer. And I think why well, if they're with con if the contracts with us, then it's notify the architect. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's what NCARP was going for here. In gotcha. real life, I would really hope that they sent an email to to me, the architect, and they also copied in the mechanical engineer, you know, yeah. like that would make more sense to me, but because this is NCARB world and we're going um, really according to the C-401, that's like the trick right there, according to AI document C-401. Uh, and the C-401, if you read into it, has a lot of really dry language about process of communication and communication channels. That's a lot of what it does, um, in addition to like establishing payment, scope, et cetera. But it, it also talks a lot about how the communications should work. Um, so even though in real life, I would kind of hope that our AV consultant could do me a solid and go ahead and already copy the mechanical engineer on it, um, what they are contractually supposed to do is con notify the architect only first. Um, yep, I understand I that. Yeah. I guess maybe there's a situation where you don't want your mechanical engineer on it. Maybe you just don't feel like he needs to know because we've already decided they're not like there's there's some additional coordination that needs to be happening here. Um, but I don't know. That's the kind of tricky stuff that I just throw in there. Yeah, that's the thing I'll have to look out for because my brain goes to like real world situations. So I got to remember that I'm taking the uh -huh. test and not doing it in the real world. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's funny. That's, I, I think sometimes it's actually easier for people who are fresh out of school to test than it is for people with 20 years of experience. <laughs> right, because right. if you're fresh out of school, you're just like reading the book and the people who write the questions for these exams are reading the book and they're writing the questions and the answers based off the book, not necessarily how yeah. you'd want to do it in real life. All right. Good discussion. Next one, a oh, rationale. According to AIA document C-401, consultant is not responsible for errors on the part of other consultants, but if they become aware of any conflicts, they should promptly notify the architect. Okay, next sample item. According to AIA document A-201, another question we wanna pay attention to the wording on because it is directly referencing the A-201. Uh, for which of the following activities is the contractor responsible? 
check the three that apply. Amongst compiling a comprehensive punch list, providing the notice of substantial completion, preparing the final change order, issuing the certificate of occupancy, providing the notice of final completion, and preparing the certificate for of final payment. And this one, I I love this question because none of this ever happens in real life. I'll tell you right off the bat, it never actually works this way. Um, and this question makes me laugh every time I read it. Okay, so I'll give you guys just a minute here to think about it. Maybe you wanna pull up the A201 right now, take a look through it, that's cool. I'll give you guys just a second to, to think and then we'll go over the answer. Okay, so next person on my list, I'm back to Mukta. Mukta, are there any, before we talk about which ones do you think are right, which ones do you think we can cross off? A comprehensive punch list, that's architect's role. So we'll cut off that. Uh, and providing note, uh, issuing the certificate of occupancy, I think that should not be a contractor's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot. You can annotate on Zoom now, too. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. I did this the hard way. Um, okay, so agree with that one. Let's Some mark this one as question mark right now. Okay. Uh, so I would go with uh, notice of substantial completion and providing notice of final completion. The cross off or is the correct answer? No, these are the correct ones. Correct answers, agree there, definitely. And change order is also crossed out because change orders are normally done by the owner or ordered by the architect, so I cross that out. And Preparing the certificate of final payment possibly is a contractor's thing to do. I'm not sure. <laughs> no worries. We're, we're getting close. And uh, like I said, this question's hilarious to me because it never works this way. Um, and mostly it's this one right here that trips people up because it is actually the contractor's job to prepare a punch list before the architect comes out and does their punch. The architect oh. is actually supposed to be given a punch list by the contractor, okay. uh, which never happens. That's not how real life works. And it, it makes me laugh to think that like, I'm supposed to get out on site and like get a punch list instead of the opposite way around it. it that did happen to me once actually, I was working with a on a project with a construction company called W.E. O'Neill, and they gave me a punch list when I got out there, uh, and they were fantastic to work with from start to finish. Um, they're the only ones who have ever done that. Okay, but I, I digress. Um, so on our rationale here, uh, actually within the A201, the contractor is responsible for compiling the punch list. They're also responsible for providing the notice of substantial completion and providing the notice of final completion. Mm -hmm. um, Another one, preparing the final change order. Uh, a lot of times um, I've been in situations where the contractors made their own change orders. The owner didn't even want us to be involved in that. So I think that's kind of funny too. Um, issuing the certificate of occupancy, yeah, we were able to cross that one out pretty quickly. Preparing the certificate of final payment. According to the A201, that is the architect's responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll pull that up if it's still hosted online. Yes, yay. 
So one thing that um, that I really recommend is if you get to this question and you like just don't know, it, it is already giving you the document that you need to look in for. So it says A201. So if maybe you don't know the answer to this question, you can write it on your whiteboard and on your whiteboard, just write A201 uh, contractor's responsibility or something. So then if you get to a case study and you have that A201 is one of your reference documents, maybe you can pull it open and you could quickly search for, let's see, is punch even in here? List is. And you can search through and see that at substantial completion, when the contractor considers that the work or a portion thereof, blah, 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 uh, the contractor shall prepare and submit to the architect a comprehensive list of items to be completed or corrected prior to final payment. Failure to include an item on the list does not alter the responsibility of the contractor to complete all work in accordance with the contract documents. So I know this is definitely something I had no idea was in the contract before I started uh, really digging into them. I don't think I even knew it when I tested. It wasn't until afterwards I, I really found out. Cool. So this question always makes me laugh, but it is a really good one. So uh, on the test, they give us all the links to these EIA documents? Usually? No, no. Um, on the test, they provide references in the case studies. Um, so the case studies are like the final 15 to 20 questions of the exam. And um, I wish I had a demonstration exam, but I, I don't think I can access it still because I'm not like a licensed testing provider or whatever. Um, okay. So if you go to your NCARB record and access the demonstration exam, you can see it really well. Um, but the last 20, 15 to 20 questions are called case studies. And those case studies have reference documents associated with them. And you can look in those reference documents to answer the questions in the case studies. Um, so a lot of times contracts will be provided as a reference document for the case studies and the project management. So you might be able to see at least a portion of the A201 as a reference document. Oh, um, smart. Yeah, That's you don't know, but so you, I always you, like to write them. You red flag them, go when we reach that section, and then you have access. That's when we look up and answer that. Yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of other thing. people will also start with the case studies. Um, so that way they know upfront which reference documents they have available. Uh, mm -hmm. That wasn't my strategy, but it's totally valid and something a lot of people do. You just need to make sure that you are um, planning in advance if you're going to do that with the break policy. So if you are planning on taking a break and also looking at the case studies first, make sure you're leaving one question for each case study unseen so you have access to the case study uh, references once you get back from your break. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. Mm -hmm. Those are some smart ways of thinking. <laughs> it's, it's just like a lot of this is is just have a plan in advance um, mm -hmm. and don't let it shake you. Because some people, I know every time I would get into a test, I, I would like get those jittery feelings and having that plan in advance just made it go more smoothly. Because even though I was jittery, I could still stick to the plan. <laughs> Okay, any questions about the A201 or contractor responsibilities? I have a quick question. Um, yeah. This one would have stumped me up. I would have clicked, the third one I would have picked would be the preparing the final change order because typically doesn't the contractor um, do the final change order and the architect signs off on it? Like there's a section where the architect signs and the owner signs. Yeah, so this is fun. Uh, because every project I've ever worked on has worked that way. But uh, according to the A201, as well as the B101, by default, the architect is the one preparing the change orders. So let's... Gotcha. So it's just the contractual language that you just have to study and, and really know. Yep. And I think... I think it's in the A201 as well as the B101. So let's see, we search through here real quick. 
Here we go. So the A201 in section 4.2.8 or article technically, uh, the architect will prepare change orders and construction change directives and may order minor changes in the work as stipulated in section 7.4. The architect will investigate and make determinations and recommendations regarding concealed and unknown conditions as provided in section 3.7.4. And let's see. Yeah, that's what I Let's see if I can still find this online. Yeah, there's a sample, perfect. So I'm pretty sure this is also in the B101 as well. Yep, um, so article three of the B101 talks about changes in work and here it also states that the architect shall prepare change orders and construction change directives for the owner's approval and execution in accordance with the contract documents. Gotcha. Um, so a lot of times you will see a little bit of information um, re-represented. I think there's a better word for that. Re-represented in the A201 that's also in the B101 and the A201. Because remember, the A201 is the sort of glue that's holding that B101 and the A101 together. The mm -hmm. A201 isn't signed, but it is adopted, quote, by reference, unquote, in both the B101 and A101 contracts. So it's where you're seeing that overlap in the relationship between the owner, architect, and contractor. Gotcha. Cool. Good question. Anything else I can help with before we move to the next one? All right. Moving right along. Sample item number seven. At the end of the design development phase for an office park, the owner reports that a major tenant has backed out of the project. The owner delays the project two months to find a new tenant or secure additional funding. Under, working under AIA contract B101, which of the following should the architect do during the two month project suspension? Check the three that apply. I'm laughing because this happens literally all the time doing commercial retail work. Um, one request payment for design development, two request a two months advance fee for the construction documents, Three, prepare final bid package before ceasing work. Four, assist the owner in lining up a new tenant. Uh, five, request payment for expenses incurred in the interruption of the architect's services. Or six, submit revised schedule for when the project resumes. Um, so this, again, has that cue as to what document you're supposed to be looking at. You're supposed to be looking at the B101. And if we were going to answer this question, what I would start by doing is opening up my E101, if it's a reference document, um, if you're just practicing in a situation like this, trying to find the answer on your own before you're in the actual exam environment, I would definitely have my B101 pulled up and maybe I would search for delay. Okay, so this is submittals, that's not related to the owner. That's not related to the owner. That's not. Article nine, termination or suspense or suspension. This is probably getting close to our situation here. So this is if the owner fails to make payment, if the architect elects to suspend services. In the event of a suspension of services, the architect shall have no liability to the owner. Uh, before resuming services, owner shall pay the architect all sums due prior to suspension and any expenses incurred in the interruption and resumption of the architect's services. Architect's fees for the remaining services and the time schedule shall be equitably adjusted. So that's probably a big hint right there. And if you keep reading down, you might have a few more hints. But let's go back here. And I'll give you guys just a minute or two to read through a little bit more if you want. And then... We'll go over the answer.
All right. Uh, Alyssa, I think you're next on my list. Um, do you have any that you think we can cross off right away? Um, I think we can re um, cross off the second one. The third one. And the fourth one. Fourth one. Perfect. And that only leads uh, leaves us with three left, and we're supposed to select the three that apply. Um, do you want to talk about your, your rationale and your reasoning at all? Um, according to B101, the owner would have to pay the architect for the work that they've done, um, the expenses that the architect incurred because the work was interrupted and that after um sorry oh no worries you're doing great i just pulled open uh the b101 in case you wanted to see it mm -hmm. and lastly they would have to um Sorry, I forgot what the last one was. Oh, no worries. I'll pull it back up. I accidentally just hit the X on it too, so. Oh, there and they go. have to submit a revised schedule because um, price could have changed. Yeah. So according to that section, the B101 we read through, if the owner suspends the project, the architect's entitled to payment for all expenses occurred up until that point. The architect can also request payment for expenses incurred because of the interruption. And if the project resumes, a revised schedule can be submitted. When an owner suspends a project, the architect should suspend the work on the project. So requesting an advance or completing other work is unwise for the architect. While assisting the owner in lining up a tenant may get the project back on track, it's beyond the scope of standard owner-architect relationship and is not the role of the architect. So pretty much everything Alyssa just said. Does anyone have any questions about this one? All right, moving on to the next section. Here we are at project execution. So section four, project execution, uh, this section assesses management of the owner's project execution. It is not about the design-related decisions, but rather the necessary administrative procedures throughout the project. Objective 4.1 is evaluate compliance with construction budget. That one's tricky. Objective 4.2, evaluate and address changes in scope of work, scope creep. Objective 4.3, evaluate project documentation to ensure it supports a specified uh, delivery method. Objective 4.4, identify and conform with the requirements set forth by the authorities having jurisdiction in order to obtain approvals for the project. Um, so authorities having jurisdiction, you might also see this called AHJ, and it's the building department, the zoning department, maybe you need to submit for the state, like in Illinois, you have to, or no, not Illinois, it's Indianapolis rather, I think. Indiana. Um, you have to submit to the state if a project is a certain scope, not just the local building department. Um, those are all the authorities having jurisdiction or the AHJs. Um, and so digging into this a little bit more, lastly, you need to be able to identify which authorities have jurisdiction over projects and determine what submittals are required for project approvals. Uh, this is way harder than it sounds sometimes if you've ever tried to log on to like a building department's website and it's just awful and you end up having to call them and talk to um, someone at the admin desk and they are mean to you and they don't like your questions. That happens a lot. Um, it can be really tricky, but very important part of the process. Uh, there aren't a ton of questions on this. I think this is just something that's really important for actual practice more so than the exams probably. But I digress. Sample item number eight. Uh, which of the following items would typically be a part of a site plan documentation submittal between the owner and the city planning department? Check the four that apply. So here we have a question that isn't directly related to contracts. Instead, it's really digging into that uh, objective we just talked about, looking at an AHJ and figuring out what is required. Um, this is kind of a general knowledge question. What would you usually need to submit as a part of a site plan documentation submittal uh, between the owner and the city planning department? 
So we are choosing amongst building footprint, legal boundary survey, building construction type, civil engineer, storm water management plan, landscape planting plan, and building life safety plan. We're choosing four. Okay, who haven't I talked to in a minute? I haven't talked to Deb, I think, because I did. Da, Alyssa, yep, Deb, you're up. Um, are there any that you think we can cross off right away? Oh, um, site plan documentation submittal between the owner and the city planning department. I don't know if the planning department needs landscape planting plan. Um, okay, maybe they do. Um, <laughs> building construction type, I don't think they need. Um, I do think they need the legal boundaries survey. I do think they'll probably want the engineer stormwater management plan. Um, the building footprint and yeah, building life safety plan, they do not need. So I guess, yeah, landscape, um, civil engineers, legal, and then the footprint, the boundary and the footprint. Awesome. You nailed it. This one's tricky because at first when you're looking at it, you think, well, the life safety plan is really important. Is landscape that important? Um, but uh, and you hear the site plan documentation referred to a number of ways, like in Denver, it's the SDP site. Yeah, it's site development plan in Denver. SDP gets thrown out a lot. Um, a lot of times you might hear this in your office referred to broadly as entitlements. And that's just a, a word people use for the whole zoning process. Um, so in this instance, let me clear this mouse. Landscape is so um, tricky because a lot of projects don't even hire like a landscape architect. I know, I know. Um, and yeah, you know, like landscape isn't typically a life safety issue. And a lot of these are, a lot of what we do is related to life safety or code. Um, but I think it's here, the site plan documentation. So they're really looking at site development. This is probably a part of the zoning process. It's not going to the building department. Instead, it's more the community and the public and whatever zoning review board may or may not exist. Um, so you did a great job, um, got there through that process of elimination and the process of elimination, I think I said this already, but I say it a lot. Uh, when you get to these check all that apply, the process of elimination can be super important. Even if you look at it and you think you know the answer, taking an extra moment to go through, cross off the ones you know are wrong can really lead to a higher degree of accuracy as you're going through these exams. And if you're like me, I tend to rush over words sometimes and it, it gives you a little bit more time to, to make sure you've read all the words in a question. So rationale, the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice discusses how most municipalities require an extensive description of a project proposal, including all aspects of the architectural design, landscape design, engineering studies for stormwater and traffic management. The building construction type and the building's life safety plans are generally included in the permitting documents. Uh, so this one's tricky. I think it's really mostly asking you to make to, to identify the difference between what you might submit for zoning versus what you might submit for a, a building department review. Does anyone have any questions on that one? All right, moving right along to sample item number nine. Please, um, I do have a quick question. The multiple yeah. choice or the multi-answer ones, do you get any points if you like get three out of four or you just hurt? Nope, <laughs> right or wrong. Um, <laughs> That does bring up a good point, though. One thing I'm notorious for when I take exams is accidentally checking only three when it asks for four. Um, so one of my own personal QA, QC processes for exam taking is I, I typically would have at least 20 minutes at the end of the exams, and I would use at least 10 minutes of that to go back and every single check all that applies question, I would highlight how many I was supposed to check and make sure I actually checked that many. 
Um, that's something I really struggle with. Um, so if you're someone who is that way too, I uh, really suggest making that just like a part of your testing process. If you have spare time, go through, look at everyone and just double check those numbers. Sometimes you click slightly off and then it doesn't get checked and you don't realize it until you're going back. Um, and it is a, a all or nothing type scenario. Um, also remember that these check all that apply questions are not weighted differently than the multiple choice. Um, the math questions where you have to type in an, an actual number aren't weighted different than the pick one out of four questions. So don't get too tripped up. Um, get your points where you can. Don't worry if you don't know. Good question, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Next math item. Uh, during the construction phase, the owner requests changes that require 10 additional footings. Uh, the contractor supplied the following cost information. The size of each footing is four and a half feet by four and a half feet by 36 feet. Crew labor cost is $175 per cubic yard. Oh, I hate cubic yards already. Um, so knowing myself, if I were looking at this, I would probably, oh, let me select the draw tool. I probably underline cubic already. Material cost, including reinforcing is 225 per cubic yard. Miscellaneous equipment costs $3 per cubic yard. Contractors overhead and profit is 10%. Construction budget is 10 million and the current construction cost is 9,900,000. How much over budget will this requested change place the project round to the nearest whole dollar? Okay, so unless anyone feels passionate about giving this math one uh, their answer, we'll just go through it together. Never like to put anyone on the spot. Um, so if I'm doing this, I might draw a footing right now. So each footing is four and a half feet by four and a half feet by 36. So we're not to scale, but this is what we're doing. This is something you could do on your whiteboard. I know the whiteboards are dumb, but got to work with what we have. So if we're trying to visualize it, that's 36. Got 4.5 deep and 4.5 across. And we are working in cubic, not like square feet, which can have major impacts that sometimes people like me forget. So first, let's figure out how big our footing is. So we'll take 4.5 times 4.5 times 36, and we'll multiply that by 10, because there's 10 of them. And I will get the calculator out. 0.5 times 4.5 times 36. So each footing is 729 cubic feet times 10. So we get 7290. Um, one of the cool things about the whiteboard is that you can copy directly from your calculator onto the whiteboard these days. You didn't used to be able to, but I'm pretty sure they have updated that. Um, so that's cool. Okay, so we have 7,290 cubic feet. Uh, concrete. Oh man, see, and here we're getting into cubic yards. So a yard is three feet. A cubic yard is three feet by three feet by three feet. And this is why I hate any time it gets into cubic yards because that's so tricky for me for some reason. So nine times nine times nine. Okay, well, that's a good number, right? Nine times nine times nine. So a cubic yard has 729 feet in it, right? Am I leading us astray here? So we can take... 
pubic feet. So what we need to do is get our cubic feet into cubic yards. So seven, two, nine, zero. How do we get that into yards? Is it divided by nine? Or is it dividing by three? Mm -hmm. Seven, two, nine, zero, divided by. Okay, I'm totally going to cheat. We're going to look at this answer. Okay, so we got the first part right. We got 7,290 cubic feet. That's the total amount of the footings. And that equals 270 cubic yards. So... 270 times what equals 700, 7,290? I think you have to divide it by 27. 27? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. See, that's where I always get tripped up. If I was looking at this question on the actual exam, I probably would have skipped it right away. I would have been like, nope, I don't play with cubic feet yards and cubic feet because that conversion factor always takes me a minute <laughs> okay <laughs> all right 270 cubic yards so step two let's go back here all of our costs are by cubic yard so 175 for crew 225 for material and three dollars for miscellaneous equipment so what they're doing next is adding all of those up and multiplying them by 270 cubic yards to get 108,810 $108, $108, We do need to account for the contractor's overhead and profit. So they're taking $108,810 times 110% to get $119,691. And then here we need to go back to our question and make sure we remember what they're asking. So they're asking how much over budget will this requested change place the, pro uh, place the project? And this can also be a little bit of a hint because we know that this value has to be over $100,000 to get us over budget. And it's saying that we are over budget. So we can always double check that to make sure we're on the right path. If we got something that was under $100,000, then we probably did our cubic feet to cubic yard conversion wrong. Like I absolutely would have if you guys weren't here. Um, so that's a, a little check for us right now. So to get the amount we're over budget, we're going to take the $119,691 plus $9,900,000. And then if we're going to subtract the $10 million, so really what we're looking for is how much over $100,000 we are. We are $19,691 over $100,000. So we're that much over budget. Um, I don't think I've talked about it yet. So I'll do a little aside here about rounding. Um, this question didn't have any rounding associated with it. It had nice whole dollars. Um, you will have questions that require you to round. It'll tell you how much to round. When you're doing your math, you might come into some situations where you're rounding as you're calculating things. Um, and don't worry too much about if you're rounding while you're calculating or if you're using a value with a bunch of decimals in it. Uh, similar to that um, click on the correct location question, NCARP is always going to define a range of correct answers that accounts for slight rounding differences between how people are calculating it. Um, so even if you round slightly different, maybe you get uh, on a different question, you got 119.12 and maybe someone else got 119.14. 
um, you're both probably going to get it correct because there is always a range of correct answers defined in those questions. Um, just try not to let it trip you up or bother you. Does anyone have any questions about this um, math question that we struggle, or I struggle best through? Okay. Cool. Next one, sample item 10. An owner has purchased 50,000 square foot parcel of undeveloped land located near an older neighborhood undergoing revitalization. The owner wants to develop land into five home situation. Working under AIA document B101, what steps should the architect take once the owner supplies an initial budget for the project? Check the three that apply amongst, analyze the budget against uniformat for design cost management, uh, evaluate the budget against the program, negotiate a higher budget for risk mitigation, analyze the budget against the schedule, begin development of the design documents based on the budget, or evaluate the budget against market conditions. Okay, so again, we're looking at the B101, and what steps should the architect take once the owner supplies an initial budget? So if I'm doing this, I might highlight AIA B101, an initial budget, I might pull open my B101. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to look through this. And then I think, Tim, you're up next to answer. But first, give you a couple minutes of silence to, to dig into it a little bit. All right, so the first cross out will be negotiate a higher budget for risk mitigation. Any others you think we can cross out? Uh, evaluate the budget against market conditions. You definitely want to evaluate the budget against the program. So that will be a correct answer. I'm not sure what the uniform at for design cost management is, so I'm not sure about that one. Um, Yeah, I mean, you would begin schematic or development, design development of the document based off of the budget, but you probably want to analyze one other thing before you do that as well. But I would I would pick that as a correct answer. This guy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think we're close. I think we're close. I think... All right, help, help me out here. <laughs> no worries. This one's being tricky. It's being tricky because... The owner working, which steps once the owner supplies an initial budget. So the key word here, I think, is once the owner supplies an initial budget amount for the project. Okay. So I think the trick here is that the project hasn't started yet. Um, so I don't think we want to begin development of design documents based on the budget just yet because gotcha. we're not even at that like kickoff point yet. Yeah. Um, and so I think we maybe just, I don't think we want him, but maybe here, I think they threw uniform at, out here just to um, just to mess with people, analyze the budget against uniform at for design cost management. Uh, that really seems like something that a contractor would do when they're pulling pricing. Analyze the budget against the schedule definitely would click that one. And then 
Let's take a look at the rationale for these two right here. Two mouse. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they are selecting evaluate the budget against market conditions over begin design development of design documents based on the budget. That's the um, architect's role. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what they had to say. According to the AA document B101, the architect should always evaluate the budget amount with respect to the stated program, anticipated schedule, and market conditions. I think what they're getting at here is that as an architect, if the owner wants a, um, a, a natural stone carved building and gives you money for an Eve's building, um, you need to tell them up front. So they, I think this phrase makes it sound like the architect's like evaluating the cost of lumber that's fluctuating right now to uh, give the owner specific uh, specific feedback on costs. But I think what they're really getting at is when the owner gives you their budget, you need to have a gut check to know if that fits with the type of program or the type of project they're asking for. And I think the way this is worded makes it sound much more serious or like intensive than it is. Yeah, um, it makes me think like, you know, market expertise, like the real estate developer, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think the they're they're trying to be tricky here. Uh, the architect should not begin the development of the design documents without first understanding the budget amount and its impact. Negotiating a higher budget as a risk mitigation technique is not a wise strategy and may jeopardize the project. Uh, Uniforma is a classification system used for estimating construction costs and does not apply to project budgeting. So uh, this question really was just asking you, like, if the owner gives you a budget, what should you think about? You should think about if the budget matches the program. You should think about if the budget matches your schedule. Um, and you should think about if the budget really is aligning with the market conditions um, and the real world cost of items. Uh, but this one's tricky. It makes you feel like you should be answering more than what you need to. Um, so I do like to bring this up because it's not, it's not super obvious, not everyone knows. Um, so when you get to your B101, the standard form of agreement between the owner and an architect, you're looking at the table of articles, one initial information, part of that initial information is the uh, budget. So let's see, where is it? Talks about the owner's consultants, architects, consultants, other information. I think I scrolled past it. I did. Um, so again, know how to control F and how to search quickly, which word you want to search for. Um, so article 1.1.3 is the owner's budget for the cost of the work as defined in section 6.1. And this is where they're supposed to tell you how much money they have. So if you can keep that in mind when you're designing, this is something that even some of my clients don't like to give me. They feel like they're giving away proprietary information if they tell me what their budget is. And it can lead to tricky spots because then once you get into 50% CDs and you have a contractor pulling a GMP, it comes in high. And then the owner's upset you've blown their budget and you have to explain to them, well, this is the program you asked for. You never gave me a budget. If you had given me a budget, we could have had this discussion earlier on about my concerns of it not meeting um, the program that you've defined or just the cost of products right now. Um, and cost of work isn't something we talked a lot about today, but cost of work is defined in section 6.1. It's something a lot of people don't know is in the B101 because it feels a little bit out of place, but it plays into that conversation and to establishing uh, parameters for the owner when it comes to you as the architect designing within a budget. Um, so I do like to bring this up for the purposes of this agreement, the cost of work shall be the total cost to the owner to construct all elements of the project designed or specified by the architect and shall include contractors, general conditions, cost, overhead and profit. The cost of work also includes the reasonable value of labor, materials, equipment donated to or otherwise furnished by the owner. The cost of work does not include compensation of the architect, the cost of land, rights away financing or contingencies for changes in the work or other costs that are the responsibilities of the owner. 
And this is the part that confuses people the most. The cost of work does not include compensation of the architect. So when you're talking about the owner's budget or the cost of work, your piece of that, your design fee is always entirely separate. Uh, the owner's budget or the cost of work only includes the cost to build the thing. It doesn't include the, um, the contingencies or the architect's portion of the design fee. Always like to bring that up. Okay. Yeah. I, I just, uh, the thought came, so the um, cost or the fees for the consultants, is that included in cost of work? Nope. The other consultants? The, nope. Any consultant fees are always separate from the cost of the work. The cost of the work is only the cost to the owner to construct the elements of the project. All right. Uh, including the contractor's cost, but not the architect's. The design fee, always separate. Um, if the owner has a civil consultant that's directly contracted to them, not through the architect, that's also separate as well. Good question. Okay, thank you. All right, moving right along to our last section, and we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, project quality control. We just have a couple of questions here, and then we'll do a Q&A. Project quality control. This last section in this division analyzes quality control methods, procedures, and review processes in order to maintain the proper standard of care throughout the entire project. As with previous sections, this section is not about the design-related decisions, but rather the necessary administrative procedures throughout the project. First, apply procedures required for adherence to laws and regulations relating to the project. Objective 5.2. Identify steps in maintaining project quality control uh, and reducing risks and liabilities. 5.3, perform quality control reviews of a project documentation throughout life of project. And objective 5.4, evaluate management of the design process to maintain integrity of design objectives. And a first question. During a peer review of design documents for a local university's new business school building, the reviewer notes conflicting code references for means of egress on the life safety sheet. The architect should design to which of the following. Uh, amongst the adopted code of the local jurisdiction, the adopted state building code, the ICC and NFPA model building codes, whichever adopted code is most stringent. So this one is pretty cut and dry. They aren't throwing a lot of tricky words out at us, which is nice. Let's see. I think we've made it all the way back around to Mukta. Uh, do you want to take a stab at this one? Any, do you feel like we can cross out at least? The model building codes, I think we can strike that out. The, the I think it should be whichever adopted code is most stringent. And yes. you would, oh, go ahead. Uh, because I thought that uh, it has to do for getting the permit. So the local jurisdiction has a play, but if the building codes are more stringent, then that should be the one which should be adopted. So I would go with the last option. And you would be absolutely correct clear that. So rationale here, the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice discusses how most jurisdictions across the U.S. have adopted building codes based on the ICC family of codes. At the same time, both state and local jurisdictions have the authority to make changes to portions of the building codes. As the architect, you have a legal duty to design in compliance with all the codes that govern the type and location of the project. Researching the jurisdictions and requirements for a specific project is the most is the responsibility of the architect. When multiple codes conflict, the most stringent code always takes precedent. Um, sometimes you'll hear people talk about a safe harbor, um, and safe harbor means a, a code path that you're following that you know will lead to compliance. Like, oh, my safe harbor is that I'm following this code, blah, 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 blah. And you always want your safe harbor to be the one that's most stringent. Um, just because a local code uh, is it saying something that's in the state code doesn't mean that you don't still have to, to follow that state code. Um, this also comes into play when you're looking at ANSI versus ADA requirements. But that situation is a little bit different. ADA is a law, not a code. Um, 
So you don't technically have to follow ADA. It's just if you don't, you, the owner can get sued later and won't be very happy. ANSI is a code, and that's the, the Chapter 11 accessibility information. Um, so you want to be following both of those. And there are specific instances where the information in them conflicts a little bit. Um, this is really specific, but it happens in the uh, requirements for grab bar installation in showers for accessible restrooms if you have a hotel or a, a publicly accessible a bathing unit for whatever reason. Uh, and in those instances, I almost always end up having more grab bars than either ANSI or ADA requires on its own because they, they conflict on, on where those should be placed. Um, so that's one instance where you have two codes, well, one code, one law, and you always want to go with the most strict adoption or whichever is, is the most stringent, as they say. Any questions there? Cool. Moving on to our last question. Sample item 12. During the review of bid documents for a renovation project, the architect notices that several details are missing information due to concealed building conditions. The full scope of the work cannot be identified until demolition work is in progress. To control project costs and limit cost increases during construction, which strategies should the architect choose as a part of the bid documents? Maybe that's something we want to highlight. Bid documents. Check the two that apply amongst contingencies, unit prices, change order, addenda, bid alternates, and supplemental instructions. Let's do a quick review during the review of bid documents for renovation. Missing information due to concealed building conditions. And our goal is to control project costs and limit cost increase during construction. All right, let's see where we're at. I think we're at Alyssa. Alyssa, are there any here you feel like we can cross out right away? Um, contingencies, change orders, addenda and supplemental instructions. You nailed it. Um, so why are you crossing these out? Um, because those are for construction already, and if you're talking about um controlling costs and limiting, then I would say um you would include some unit prices and alternates, and it's also because um because of the missing conditions, you don't know what's going on. Yeah, definitely. And I love how you figured that out because um, really, I think the first thing you did, and which is exactly what I would have done, is looked at the time frame um, and saw that it was during bid. So bid is before construction, contingencies, change orders, um, supplemental instructions and addenda. Those are all things that happen during construction usually. Um, so if you're looking at what you can do as a part of the bid documents, this word right here, big hint, bid alternates, yes, unit prices, yes. Um, and those are all strategies you can use to help control costs. And the rationale, often on renovation projects, there are unknown elements or quantities until demolition occurs. Strategies to minimize this risk should be discussed with the owner and incorporated into the documents. Unit prices established for costs for performing additional work by the contractor when entering unknown conditions. Bid alternates define a, a, a change in cost for scope or quality of materials during the bidding process. This provides the owner options to reduce the overall construction costs as necessary in order to maintain the project budget. Contingencies should be a part of the project budget and cost estimate, but are not a strategy for controlling costs. Change orders are issued during construction to identify changes in the contract, but are also not an effective cost control. Addenda modify the bid documents during the bid phase, but do not control costs. Supplemental instructions are modifications to the general conditions of the contract and typically have a limited impact on costs. All right, any questions there? Moving right along. Uh, just a little bit of blurb here about AIA Cincinnati's resources. Um, so 
Uh, this is put on by the AIA Cincinnati's Early Professionals Committee. Uh, the committee kind of went dormant during COVID, and we've been working really hard over the past couple of years to bring it back. This program is one of uh, the initiatives that we're, we're trying to provide for everyone. Um, so we also have an ARE resource library. Um, we have some primary materials that are available for checkout, as well as third-party materials. Most of these are physical right now, but we are working on getting a digital library up and running on the AIA state level. Uh, but for now, these are mostly just available physically in Cincinnati. Um, so you can check out some of those physical copies. Uh, you can also join these monthly, and we have, I think, one more in this cycle, and then we're going to kind of evaluate how we do these workshops, because we did have lower attendance for some of them, so we're going to be looking at how we can make this more helpful and spread the word that these are out there for everyone. If you have any feedback, feel free to, to email um, AIA Cincinnati, me, anyone. We love feedback, and it helps us figure out how, how to make these better for everyone. Um, the other great thing about getting involved in the AIA Cincinnati's Early Professionals group is that you can be a part of community of other young professionals who are maybe working on licensure, are recently licensed, or we also have seasoned professionals who are a part of our group who really just want to give back to the, the next generation. Um, so you can visit AIA Cincinnati's website and you can register for some of our events, monthly planning calls, whatever you're interested in. And last but not least, Q and A. Um, we talked a lot today and kind of broadly covered a whole lot of topics. We didn't dig too much into any one topic or any one section of the exam. Um, but does anyone have any questions that they want to ask? We can talk through. I can help answer. Do you have uh, any reference material that you recommend apart from the standard ARE things like any uh, uh, like Black Spectacles or Ballast or any other resources that you think would be helpful? Uh, for project management and practice man management, the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice, um, that's really like a primary resource for those two exams. And you can probably get by um, just reading the contracts and the Architect's Handbook of Professional Practice and pass. Um, personally, myself, I used Black Spectacles when I was studying and testing. I started testing right when ARE 5.0 was released. That's the, the current iteration of the exam. Um, and this was well before they had the demonstration exam for free. The only way you could kind of use a clone of the exam was through Black Spectacles. Um, mm -hmm. So I was using it mostly for practice exams at first, and then I ended up failing PPD and PDD back to back. Uh, and that's when I really dug into some of the other resources available through Black Spectacles. That was mainly their lectures. I watched every single lecture, took extensive notes. I filled up two giant notebooks and I also utilized the uh, practice exams heavily. And after doing that, I was able to pass the PPD and PDD exams back to back after failing them. Um, so I personally do recommend Black Spectacles and they also used to pay me to host their workshops um, and be their uh, community moderator and I used to be their Facebook moderator um, and it, I had a great experience working for them and meeting and helping people get licensed over COVID so I am very biased but I did like black spectacles um, when it comes to the larger exams like PPD PDD and also PA that's really where I do recommend some sort of aggregate single source study material whether that is using black spectacles or it's just getting the brightwood or ballast books um, once you get to those exams there's too many resources for you to read all of them unless you have just too much time um, so that's really where I think it's super important that you pick one sort of study material that aggregates all those sources into one spot um, but for PCM and PJM, I think it is possible to study successfully just by looking at the contracts and the um, architect handbook of professional practice. Everyone is different, though. You got to find what works for you. Um, if you're someone who really, really struggles with especially PPD and PDD, those longer tests, 
uh, Young Architects has had fantastic reviews, and I know people who have used their services very successfully. Um, if you're looking for free stuff online, Hyperfine has some free materials. Um, Black Spectacles actually has a lot for free too. They have free YouTube videos, and I think on their website, you can still preview some of their lecture videos for free. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, those are the first places I, I, I would look if I were you. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, and definitely leverage those free materials through NCARB to your advantage, like the demonstration exams um, mm -hmm. and their videos too. Anything else I can help with? Okay. Well, I, I have will... a quick question. Do you have a recommended yeah. um, like order that you take things in or what worked for you? Uh, so I started testing right when ARE 5.0 came out and I was also doing integrated path to licensure. So I was able to test during school. I only signed up for it because if you signed up for the integrated path to licensure program, you, you had uh, the option to take prep classes through uh, through the University of Cincinnati was where I was at. So I didn't actually intend to test it all while I was in school. I just wanted access to the test prep classes because you couldn't take them unless you were in the IPAL path. And they were doing early testing still. So I ended up, and if you did early testing and you failed, you got a free retake. So it was like, you got a test for free and then you just got a free redo if you failed. Um, so I took C and E after studying for a day and I failed. And then I took PJM after studying for a single day while I was in school. And I ended up passing it somehow, um, which is kind of why I decided once I got to Black Spectacles to stick with the project management, something that lends to my professional experience and also just like my natural inclination. So I started with project management, then I went practice management, then I did... CE, then PA, and I saved PPD and PDD for last. If you are starting fresh out of school, I actually, people who are fresh out of school, I actually suggest they start on programming analysis and then do PPD and PDD uh, because those are more related to sort of design-based topics, the kind of things that you might be studying in school more so than PJM, PCM, and CNE. Um, Construction evaluation is really related to construction administration processes, which a lot of younger people might not have experience with. Maybe saving that one for last, as well as project management and practice management makes more sense so you can knock out the other three while you're gaining your professional experience. If you're someone who's a seasoned professional or has at least five years of work experience, then I would probably uh, do pra practice management, project management, this is where I would switch it up from the order and card puts it in. I would take construction and evaluation after. All three of those relate to contracts and the architect's handbook of professional practice. They gang together really well. PCM and PJM, ton of overlap. Not so much overlap as seen in construction and evaluation, but uh, it's close second. Um, and then I would do programming and analysis, then PPD, then PDD. When you're looking at how you gang these together, um, there are some I recommend studying for together if you have the time. Um, I suggest overlapping project management and practice management as well as uh, PPD and PDD. I always get those acronyms wrong. It's project planning and design and project development and documentation. Those two, tons of overlap. Um, if you have the time, what I like to tell people to do is take one month and study for practice management and project management together. Um, try to cover all those topics at once. Then take one month just to focus on project management, then take that exam. Uh, then take another month just to focus specifically on practice management and then take that exam or vice versa. Um, but I, I suggest the same thing for PPD and PDD. Take one month studying for them both together, then just a month focused on PPD before your exam, then a month focused just on PDD before your exam. That was a lot of acronyms and I hope that made sense and didn't sound like word salad. No, that was very helpful, thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> 
anything else? It doesn't have to be related to, to project management, um, general test questions, testing strategies, happy to help. Do you have any information about the latest new exam uh, proctoring thing and whether it's better to take it from home or at the center? <sighs> oh man, okay. So I did all my testing through, um, through Prometrics, not through the new testing provider, uh, whose name is escaping me now for some reason. So a lot of my experience is based around that Prometrics testing. I was instructing workshops when they first started the online, for Black Spectacles, when they first started the online proctoring program. And uh, it's really great that they pushed it out so fast because this was during COVID and a lot of people didn't have access to testing centers. Um, however, I did have a lot of people on these workshops and people I talked to and people on messaging boards reporting that they had technical issues with the online proctoring system. Um, I think some of those issues have been resolved now that they've switched testing providers and have gotten better. But my advice is to, if you do want to do the online proctoring system, they have a free like trial system um, where you can kind of set up a, a trial run before your exam, definitely do that and read the rules really, really carefully. Um, like I heard a story where someone was taking an exam and they had their door closed and their cat opened the door and the proctor started yelling at them, threatening to fail them because the cat went in the room. Um, it, it's their job. They have to do that. But you just want to make sure that you fully understand the requirements of the online proctoring, make sure your room is very secure, and understand that the online proctoring is not foolproof. There have been instances where people are waiting for an online proctor for extended periods. Um, you need to be plugged in to the internet via ethernet cable. Do not rely on Wi-Fi. It is not consistent enough and it will not work. You have to be plugged in via ethernet and have a, a pretty fast Wi-Fi. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a testing center that's not too far away from you, I personally would suggest going to the testing center. Um, but I know that's not an option for a lot of people just based on proximity or schedule. People with kids tend to use the online proctoring more, I think. Uh, but then you have to make sure that your kid is not going to come into the room or bother you at all while you're testing. Um, so, I, I default to in-person, but everyone's different. Just just make sure you read all the rules and take advantage of um, the previews and, and any services that they have available to make sure it works before you commit to it. There's nothing worse than losing out on the $250 testing fee because your internet cut out or something silly. Um, there isn't always a good way to get your money back if something like that happens. Thank you. No problem, good question. All right, well, we are right at noon. So I will go ahead and close this out. But if you think of any questions, feel free to, to email me. Um, you can email the AIA Cincinnati's contact. And uh, Julie is our executive and she'll direct it to, to me. Um, you can hit here, contact. Um, I don't think my name is on the internet. I know my name is on the internet, but I don't think my email is. My email is, um, I probably shouldn't say this out loud. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to AIA Cincinnati and she will direct it to me. And then um, I'll get in touch and answer any additional questions you might have. Um, we'll also be here next month, I think, looking at programming and analysis, if I'm not mistaken. But feel free to check all our events on the events calendar. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye.